If you're planning a road trip in the United States or want to explore the food your own state has to offer, 50 States 1000 Eats from National Geographic can be your guide to discovering fun food events and great dining experiences. Well, stay tuned, I'll talk with Joe Yogurst about 50 States 1000 Eats, where to go, when to go, what to eat, what to drink. Hi, I'm Dan Skinner and this is Some Books Considered. During his more than three decades as an editor, writer, photographer, and speaker, Joe Yogurst has lived and worked in Asia, Africa, Europe, and North America. His writing has appeared in numerous publications, including Condé Nast Traveler, CNN Travel, Washington Post, Los Angeles Times, and Forbes Travel, just to name a few. He's also worked on more than 40 National Geographic books, and he joins us to talk about 50 States, 1,000 Eats. Joe, welcome to Some Books Considered. Thank you. Nice to be back. Well, this book is organized by state, and you have different sections in the book, you know, like restaurants to die for and a kind of a profile of the state, etc. So tell us a little bit about how each of those states' information is organized. Um, well, we started out, we wanted to talk not just about restaurants, but about the food culture in each state and some of the signature dishes and um, also the drinks, because um, that's important. A lot of, I, a lot of uh, the iconic things from various states are, are drinks and not just, not just foods. Um, and, uh, and sidebars that have to do with uh, you know, celebrity chefs or a particular type of regional food, things like that, um, food adventures you can take. So it's kind of broken down that way. Um, it starts out with um, kind of the you know the iconic or famous foods and dishes and crops and things from different states, and then we go into food events, which can be everything from a, st a state fair to a, a food fe a seafood festival or apple festival, things like that. Or um, another thing that's featured there are certain you know a winery route that you know that you can take to sample different wines, and then restaurants and then uh, drinks and you know bottoms up and. Uh, so that's how it's organized. And it's billed as 50 states, but you do sneak across the border to Canada for a little bit. Yes, we do all of the, uh, the Canadian provinces and Yukon territory. Um, Yukon was one of the more interesting places uh, to investigate the food scene. You kind of think there's not going to be very much, and it turns out there's quite a bit. But that's true of a lot of places. Well, it's 1,000 eats, so a lot of territory to cover. How did you and your team decide which things to include? Well, we did a, a short list that turned out to be very long. I think it was 40 pages, our, our short list of uh, literally thousands of places to choose from. Um, based on my own travels, I started doing this series of books back in 2016, and this is the seventh one in the series. So I had six to go, you know, six to, to draw on before that, where I did trips all over the, the U.S. and Canada. And the editors in Washington, D.C. at National Geographic, they, they contributed a lot of their fam favorite places, not just in the D.C., Northern Virginia area, but where they were from. One of uh, the people that was deeply involved in this book is from New Jersey. So she had a lot of recommendations for that state. And... Um, and uh, so we, you know, we put together this this very long short list, and then started paring it down. And you kind of have to deal. You look at the Michelin star places and the famous places, and you think, well, we have to at least mention those. But I'm always on the lookout for roadside diners and mom and pop restaurants and smaller places, because I know just from traveling my whole life that sometimes the the unassuming places can have the most amazing food. Speaking of diners, one that caught my attention, it's now on my short bucket list of places to visit, is this Oasis Diner in Plainfield, Indiana, because it, it's just one of those classic diners from the 1950s. Um, there's actually a, a lot of those around, not so much where I live out on the West Coast, um, because, you know, diner uh, diners kind of got overtaken here by by the original fast food restaurants, the McDonald's and things that were invented here, they, they were created back in the 1950s. Um, they kind of overshadowed diners and they went away. And a lot of urban diners ended up, the classic ones with the streamlined, almost like Pullman rail car looks that started out in places like New York City and Boston. 
they started to go away, but people would purchase them and literally move them like a trailer to a, a, a rural, uh, to a small town or, or, or a rural location and reopen them. So the diners survived because they kind of fled the big cities. Um, and I think that was a great trend. And they, even, I remember even going back to my college days of driving around on summer road trips that I was always looking for diners to eat at. And because and, I thought they have great, you know, vintage heritage heirloom locations and atmospheres. But um, but I also think the food is just great at diners. It's classic American food, especially for breakfast. I'm talking with Joe Yogurst about 50 states, 1,000 eats, and our conversation continues in a moment. If you're enjoying this discussion, please take a moment to subscribe, like, and click on the bell so you'll know when I post new interviews with authors. And thank you. So what were some of the more unusual foods that you encountered as you were doing your research? Michigan's Upper Peninsula, um, Uper cuisine, um, which is very, it's a very unusual regional food that not a lot of people out of the region or away from Michigan know about. Um, the Upper Peninsula was populated by, by Cornish miners who came over to work the copper mines there after working the tin mines in England. And, and Finnish immigrants who thought that the forest and the lakes reminded them of back home. So you have these Cornish uh, pastries that are stuffed with, um, with beef and vegetables and other things like that, rutabaga and things, and, uh, which are really delicious. And you have these Finnish specialties. Um, the Finnish pancakes with berry sauce are just amazing. Um, so that's kind of a regional food that I came across that I didn't know about before. That, uh, that that's very tasty, that, that again is, and that's very similar in North Dakota. I spent, um, I had a writing job in, in North Dakota a couple couple years back where I had to spend six months there. And I discovered, discovered Kroll's Diners, K-R-O-L-L apostrophe S, which is specializes in, in German food, which again, because of the German immigrants who went to North Dakota, but you don't expect to find um, a diner in North Dakota that specializes in sauerkraut and Germans and bratwurst, right? But uh, um, so regional cuisine is still very much alive. A lot of it is um, is powered by the immigrants who originally went there. You know, Cuban food in Miami, Tex-Mex, and San Antonio has just got. I think San Antonio is the best eating the eating place in Texas um, because you have the regular you know Texas steak, but you have this incredible Tex-Mex cuisine. And you have kind of Nouvelle Tex-Mex of experimental modern Tex-Mex that goes on in San Antonio and great dive bars. <laughs> so. I would second that. I lived in San Antonio for six years and love ah, the Tex-Mex okay. there. And I've never been able to find that anywhere else that I've lived. In fact, sometimes if I ask people about certain dishes I really enjoyed there, like uh, chilaquiles, or they also called them migas, I get this blank stare. No one knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, uh, I've been to San Antonio a couple times and really enjoyed it. I went there as, as a teenager with my parents. And I, I remember that we went to the, the old Pearl Brewery and did the tour. And my, of course, my parents did the, the tasting at the end. Well, that's, that's long gone, the Pearl Brewery. But, um, but the Tex-Mex is still there. And um, the bar where Teddy Roosevelt um, recruited the Rough Riders, allegedly, um, is still there. Um, that I had to go to. And, um, you know, regional cuisine, I, I also kind of look out for that, you know, low country cuisine in, in South Carolina and also Savannah across the river in Georgia. Um, and uh, seafood in New England, Maine in particular, is, is really amazing. Um, Southern Arizona, Sonoran Mexican style food. Um, and New Mexico has its own unique cuisine that's been around for 400, 500 years almost. Um, California style Mexican food, which is nothing like real Mexican food, um, fish tacos in particular. Um, and so everywhere you go, there's, I think there's specialties. You know, I'm a big bison fan, Montana, Wyoming, Colorado. If there's a bison burger or bison steak on the menu, that's what I'm going to go for. Another kind of unusual, at least thing we don't see every day, is Alabama white barbecue sauce. <laughs> um, yes, it was. It's totally independent from. It goes on to chicken wings, fried chicken wings, of course. Alabama is famous for fried chicken already. It's one of the 
iconic dishes there. And there was a guy, Big Bob Gibson in Decatur, um, Alabama, who back in the 1920s, long before we had ever heard about buffalo chicken wings, that decided he was going to put this spicy horseradish and, and cayenne chili-based uh, white sauce on his, his wings and serve them that way. And it became a big deal in, in Decatur and other places in, in Alabama. And it's uh, really got a kick to it. So I think even more than buffalo chicken wings that you got to like your wings spicy for, for, for white sauce. As you pointed out, you also cover what to drink in this uh, basically guidebook of food across the United yeah. States and into Canada. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of distilleries and breweries now that didn't exist many years ago. So tell us a little bit about that scene and some highlights from the book. Well, it started, the whole craft brewery thing started in Oregon in the, in the 1980s when they changed the law up there to say that you could start making beer at home legally and that you could start selling it, um, which was revolutionary at the time because no one else in the whole country was allowed to do that. You could make your own beer at home, but you couldn't sell it. And these guys up there thought, okay, if I can sell it, I'm going to start my own little brewery. And it spread from there across the country. It just kind of caught, you know, cut fire and Right now, I think that uh, Oregon is really overshadowed by Colorado and, uh, and where I live in San Diego um, as kind of the hotspots for craft brewery, but you find them all over the place. Um, where I live, San Diego County has between 120 and 150 craft breweries. And I would like to say that I've tried them all, but I, but I haven't. Um, but I have, I have my local one here, New English, and in the, on the North Coast. Um, and starting in the, really uh, at the beginning of this century, the aughts or whatever they call that first decade, um, you started having craft distilleries too. Um, people making gin and whiskey and vodka on their own. Um, so you go to Idaho and one of the things you come across is, uh, is craft vodka distilleries because it's potato land. And what is vodka made from? But, but it's potato alcohol, right? So... And it's, it's, it's really amazing stuff. Um, I came across a, an amazing little gin distillery in North Carolina. I didn't really like gin before I, I had it at this place. And I thought, well, I've been drinking the wrong kind of gin my whole life. And uh, I really need to do the, the craft gin. Um, and, uh, you know, I, with, with whiskey and bourbon, the, the big names, Johnny Walker, et cetera, uh, you know, Wild Turkey, they're still the, the biggies f for the industry, and I don't think that the craft distilleries have caught up with them yet. But I think in terms of vodka and gin and other, and, and rum to a certain extent, that these little distilleries have really caught up and have amazing products. I'm wondering how you envision people using this book, because I, I can see it as learning what's in your home state, but also as a road trip guide and maybe creating a culinary bucket list. Well, like all the, like all the books in this series, this is the seventh one, um, they're really not for where you live. They're, where you, they're for where you want to go. And I think that, you know, you can look and see what's local, but you're going to have your favorite restaurants and eating spots, right? And you're probably going to think, oh, why isn't that in this book? Well, it's because we couldn't put 100,000 restaurants in this book. Um, so it's really a guide to, if, you know, if you live in you know, in, in Michigan and you want to go to Florida, where can I eat in Miami that's interesting or different? Or um, or if you live in Maine and you want to go to Arizona, where can I eat in Phoenix or Tucson or, or near the Grand Canyon that's maybe a little bit different or interesting? So it really is about a, a book that supplements where you want to travel to. Um, I wouldn't specifically say go to a place because of the food, although there are destinations like that, New York, San Francisco, Chicago, LA, there are, you know, New Orleans, Charleston, Savannah are great food destinations, but, but there's other cities, you know, every city has great food and hopefully this, you know, and every state has amazing food. And this gives people some idea of what's available, what's local, what's, what's, what's really good in these states. It's a sample, right? Of I'm already going there. What can I eat when I get there? Well, there's so much more in this book that we don't have time to discuss, so we've only been able to give you a taste of what's here. The book is 50 States, 1,000 Eats, Where to Go, When to Go, What to Eat, What to Drink. And it's a book by National Geographic, so it's also filled with wonderful photographs. The book, 
by Joe Yogurst. Joe, thank you for talking with me today. Thanks for having me on again. It's, uh, it's nice to uh, meet you in person, so to speak. If you'd like to purchase 50 States 1000 Eats, I've placed a link for you in the description below. And if you'd like to see more videos about books and their authors on a wide variety of topics, be sure to subscribe, like, and click on the bell to be notified about future programs. I'm Dan Skinner. Thank you for watching this edition of Some Books Considered.